It's a Bubblecast Mini, sponsored by Tetsuya the Wise. What was your response to the written by Ian Flynn memes that were being shared on Twitter? The what? <laughs> I think, if I'm not mistaken, this was when after Frontiers and there was, you know, the kind of the little bit of a backlash for you to kind of relying heavily on references to previous material. And I think that's where they came from. I think. Okay. I I don't know. I didn't see anything. I am legit in the dark on this. Wow. All right. I mean You're telling me there was a meme around me and I didn't even get to see it? I I guess. I guess so. I didn't see much of okay, it myself. Really is I didn't see much of myself when I mean, some of them are very much stretching and very silly. But you know. <laughs> Well, as long as everyone had fun, I guess. I suppose. Let's see what I can if I can find something in here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jokes about you referencing things in the past. People took it to like an extreme and started applying it to things you didn't write, like Mega Man X Five, <laughs> <laughs> or SA One and SA Two. <laughs> It's like, oh, references to old stuff. Must be written by Ian Flynn. It's like, okay. Uh, I mean, they're, they're stretching hard. Stretching very hard. <laughs> but also, they're very funny. Uh, I'll, I'll give you credit for some of them. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. Maybe look that up later, Ian. Have some fun with that. One game critic I watch on occasion recently released a video on tone in regards to video game storytelling. There was a section where they talked about Sonic Frontier's story and how they couldn't take it seriously. Nor should Sonic as a series try to take itself seriously because the main character is a blue cartoon hedgehog who fights an evil fat man. What is your response to such a take? Agree and disagree. Agree in that you should be aware of the tone in your narrative and how its visual representation reflects that. Um, it is extremely hard to do something grounded and gritty with a cartoony aesthetic. And if you are coming to Sonic from the outside, not someone who is deeply in love with the franchise, like so many of us here, the tonal dissonance of Frontiers could be extremely jarring. And I get that. At the same time, the response from the died in the wool Sonic fandom to the serious storyline and the attention we gave to the characters, I think really tells you what that audience is mm -hmm. like to us. We don't see brightly colorful cartoon characters. We see the individuals. It goes beyond just the archetypes. We see the people that they are and we've grown to love and we appreciate them being treated with a degree of respect and uh, sincerity. So in that regard, Sonic has gone on for so long and has such a dedicated diehard fan base that I almost feel like it's become its own genre in and of itself. In a way, yeah. And while you shouldn't rely on an insular market, I feel like coming from the outside of Sonic and saying, no, this is silly, don't do that, is you coming into somebody's birthday and pissing on their cake it's <laughs> sonic has always sonic's had serious elements since 99 it's oscillated sure but there's always been a little bit of edge to him i mean it's even been... before that even with if you go for at least the western takes with sad am and stuff yeah and like sonic is this weird thing where you have brightly colorful animals that deal with you know very melodramatic and dark themes sometimes. And that's just what Sonic is. Mm -hmm. And if that's not your cup of tea, sure. I get it. You know, there is a ton of other stuff out there for you to enjoy, but I feel like Sonic itself, because of its longevity and its kind of commitment to the bit, <laughs> uh, it, it's not really right to come out and critique it, to say this is wrong. Cause it's, that's just what Sonic is. 
I mean, yeah, colors was more joyful and goofy and, you know, comparing the styles of like even unleashed to forces are almost night and day, but there's still this kind of undercurrent of very dramatic melodramatic storylines in Sonic. It just kind of is what it is. They really are just not- superhero. It's just superhero stories, just with little cartoon animal people instead. <laughs> yeah, it's very similar. If you, if you can't make that leap, I get it. Yeah, I really do. I do. But at the same time, it itself is not inherently wrong. It's just you're not the audience that enjoys it, and that's fine mm-hmm. in both ways. Yeah, to people on the outside, Sonic looks v- very like cartoony and people treating it seriously they they look like weirdos i get it i understand that but i mean i'm gonna be the weirdo so yeah you will be a weirdo about something else (laughs) it's it's fine i'm okay with it i think it is i think i do like it when a sonic story is a little bit more goofy rather than dark but yeah just kind of I mean, it really kind of depends, honestly. So, I liked Frontiers' story, and that was way more serious in tone than a lot of the other more recent games. So, I don't know, man. It's just I just like a good story. So, yeah, with good characters. That's what I want. In my last set of questions, I asked how each member of the Sonic cast would react to being asked for a photo and an autograph. While I tried to list as many characters I thought would be interesting for the subject, there were some I left out. So how would Team Hooligan, the Freedom Fighters, Breezy, Takal, Marine, Julie, Sue, Scourge, Fiona, Nagas, Mogul, and Sage react to being asked for a photo and autograph? All right. So uh, Fang would be flattered. He would totally do it, and he would use the opportunity to rob you. Yep. Bark would be extremely self-conscious, but he would be more uh, embarrassed to not do it. So he would go through with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bean would be all about it. Absolutely. (laughs) Uh, Sally would be a trifle self-conscious about it, but you know, she's royalty. She's kind of used to this attention. So she'd roll with it. Nicole would be flattered to even be, you know, thought of in that way. So sure. She's on board. Uh, Roger's kind of weirded out. Really? He's getting the spotlight, but okay, sure. All right. Antoine would totally mug it up. <laughs> oh yes, of course. I shall put my mind up. Uh, Bunny would be tickled. She'd be all for it. Uh, Breezy, she has an industry built around that. I was going to say, Breezy just, uh, this is Breezy's Tukal life. Wants to know what a photograph... <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Takal wants to know what a photograph is. Uh, Marine is super into it, absolutely. Yep. Julie Sue kind of gives you a weird look, double checks to make sure this isn't, you know, some way to distract her before the sniper takes a shot. No, you're really wanting to do this? Okay, we'll do it. Bye. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Scourge, oh, he absolutely gets into it, and he's insulted if you don't want to do more than one picture and autograph. Uh, Fiona depends. Like, if it's just by herself, she doesn't trust that she's not going to go anywhere near you. If she's with Scourge, she'll get in on the act and rob you blind. Uh, <laughs> Nagus uh, only agrees to it if you sign this elder contract, and then he possesses your body, and it becomes a bad time. Mogul, absolutely. He probably has an industry for it. And Sage is just perplexed. No, go away. (laughs) I feel like Sage would be like very confused. She would like, she would do research on this weird ritual that people do where they ask for pictures and autographs and be like, this is very strange. I don't understand this. Why are you doing this? For what purpose? (laughs) yeah yeah it would be just very weird (laughs) Uh, i mentioned the altered storybook in dragoon in my last questions as well but i was wondering what the inspiration for that was i just general historical knowledge uh, understanding where propaganda comes from and when it starts uh, how it is implemented and in its various ways it isn't just for you know the voting populace there are materials out there specifically designed for children you hook them while they're young yep um and it also doesn't always come in the overt pageantry and super bowl ads it is subversive it's woven into the daily entertainment both 
uh, aggressively and on purpose or through ignorance. And that was part of what the horror of the children book was supposed to be is that it's written in a way that it could be innocuous, that this is just what a particular human author thought, which is kind of disgusting, or it was a legitimate attempt to brainwash early on, which is also disgusting. And that's the terror of propaganda. Yeah, pretty much. Also on the topic of Drogoon, do you plan to have a lot of deconstructive elements of the action adventure genre down the line, or do you plan on playing most tropes associated with it straight? What a handsome question. Um, <laughs> I am not aiming to do any kind of deconstruction with Drogoon. Drogoon is my outlet for creativity. My career has been based on licensed books, and while I have enjoyed a great deal of creative freedom with those, there is still that ever looming directive you have to stay in your lane you have to color inside the lines it has to be for this product drogoon is just for me this is going to be something i find fun this is something that i feel is good and interesting and engaging and i will put it out there because i want other people to enjoy it and i hope they get a lot out of it too uh, i'm sure there will be greater elements and uh deconstructions by the readers they will say oh clearly in this and this and this or you can see his biases with such and such and such and you know what fair enough review and critique that's what we do to all art and i hate it but <laughs> i'm my primary goal with drogoon is just to tell a fun adventure sci fantasy story just to put it out there mm -hmm. just to make something neat I'm okay with that. It's very neat indeed. What was your thought process for how the Drogoon characters were designed? I know you weren't the artist for the comic, but did you give it a lot of instructions on how you wanted the characters to look, or did you give Adam a lot of creative freedom when deciding how they would appear? A little column A, a little column B. Um, some aspects I had a very clear vision for, and others I'm like, ah, I don't know what to do with this, Adam. What do you think? You are incredibly talented. Put a spin on it. But stuff like the biology of the Drogoon as a race, um, the visual themes that should go into Wind at, versus how she looks next to Indelis, uh, what the Aje look like, what that should be represented in form, what the Drawf are like as a race, and how Joblin should look next to all of them. What do they look like in a lineup as a court cast? That was all stuff I had in mind, all part of the notes going to him. Uh, you know, what are the races? What do they look like? What are the base traits of each one that you can extrapolate on what are the environments they live in what do the realms themselves look like and what do those environments mean and what do they entail for the races that live within them it's it's a lot of back and forth it's a lot of creative work between the two of us working together and hopefully we will share more of that in the future nice as a creative mind i want your thoughts on the idea that all art is inherently political there are many people who complain when a work is too political, and many more who say that complaining about such a thing is silly because art, by its very nature, is inherently political. Do you think there are merits to both sides of the argument, or do you, or do you stand somewhere entirely different? Yes, in that everything is colored by the perspective of the creator. Yep. You know, as much as I say Drogoon is built off of my desire to create something fun my own personal worldview is going to affect that. What I think is good, what I think is exciting, what I think is evil, what I feel like is uh, worth engaging in or calling out, that's all going to be part of the script, whether I intentionally want it to be there or not. And, you know, my view will not necessarily be the same as yours, so your perception of the work is going to you know, potentially clash with that. And our own political ideals will change how I create the material and how you perceive the material. Now there's something to be said for subtlety yeah. and for application of those worldviews. If you're doing a open satire, then sure, that's going to be more politically charged. Or if you are, you know, trying to push a particular agenda or a particular worldview and you are not shy about it, then yeah, it can be overtly political. And in some cases it can 
derail the narrative when you've got someone who gets up on their soapbox and puff, pontificates about what they think should be. And it's like, all right, yeah, we get it. This is your Facebook post. Sure. Um, and there's a time and place for all of that. You know, uh, it may not necessarily serve some media than others. It may not be used appropriately, but inherently, yes, all art is political because all art is a statement to some degree or another. Right. Yep. I agree with that. I think it is kind of a little silly to say that art isn't necessarily political because it's always colored by the perceptions of the people who write it. And politics is a very um, integral part of our society as it is. So I, I do think that it is a little silly to say that, it, oh, it's political to include certain things or whatnot, things that we wouldn't have included, things that wouldn't necessarily have been included in a story you know, even a decade or two ago <clears throat> to have those now is not necessarily just a political move to score a political points. It's like just trying to tell a story, but guys, I mean, uh, just... there's also the extremes of, you know, people who think what should stuff that is just basic elements of life are po being political. Yeah the very existence of something is inherently political because I don't agree with it. And it's like, no, it's just, it's there. It always has been. Sorry. Yep. But then you also have those who, you know, see someone create a villainous character and have them do villainous things and think that the author therefore is a proponent of these villainous things, because why would you write a bad thing unless you like the bad thing? Yeah. Like, Ian. No, that, that's part of the narrative construction. You, you set it up to tear it down. So, I don't know. It's wearying. <laughs> yeah, Ian. Why was Starlight your self-insert? <laughs> why did you do that? Really? That's one of them? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this okay. was... Starlight was your way of inserting your commentary on Eggman as a villain, obviously. <laughs> okay. Ian really went, F them kids. <laughs> Oh boy, we figured it out. We, now we know. <laughs> All right, moving on to the next question. Moving on from controversial subject matter, I'm not so sure about that. I'll ask something silly. In my last mini, I asked how Saul Goodman would defend Dr. Eggman in court. But what would happen if, instead of working for Gus Fring, Walt and Jesse somehow found themselves working for the Eggman Empire? Would Walt see the doctor as a man child that doesn't deserve the power he has? What kind of antics would Jesse get up to with Orbot and Cubot? Would Walt Jr. still get his breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we touched upon this in another bit of Bumblecast, but seeing Walter White try to out-swagger Eggman mm -hmm. would be fascinating. Because, yeah, the buffoonery would convince him that this guy's an idiot. And he's clearly smarter. He's the one who's designing these new line of badniks. He should be the one in charge. He is the danger. He is the one who knocks. Except you don't cross Eggman. No. And you would get the moment where, <laughs> as Bald figured out when he pissed off Gus, he is a very small man. <laughs> <laughs> a very small means. And he would be put in his place and it would be absolutely glorious. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, as for Jesse, Corbot and Cubot joyriding in the Eggmobile, activating various attachment weaponry and knocking stuff over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nah, that'd be fun. I like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be good. <laughs> uh, Walter may be the one who knocks, but Eggman is the Eggman. Cuckoo, cuckoo. Wait, no, wrong Eggman <laughs> On the topic of crossovers, how would a fight between Sonic and Homelander from The Boys play out? Would he be able to beat him even without the Chaos Emeralds? If you need an idea of what Homelander is capable of, the Death Battle episode of Him vs. Omni-Man should give you a good idea. Oh, now we have to do homework for questions? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't look this up specifically, but Homelander is basically Superman without the moral compunction, right? I, I, I mean, you might know more than me. I'm 
I mean, if they're pitting him against Omni Man, who is also a Superman analog, mm. then he must be in a Kryptonian tier. And I'm sorry, Sonic is not competing with that at all. Mm -hmm. Like base form Sonic? Uh uh. No. He he's gonna be a smear on the road. Yeah, probably. And I'm also being told, yeah, pretty much you're you were on you were on track. Uh, a question for Kyle and Ian. What are some of your favorite comedy albums? The best example of one I can think of is Super Ghostbusters by Vine Sauce Joel. It never fails to make me double over from laughter. I am not familiar with this, but I need to hear it because I love Joel. <laughs> I mean, Weird Al seems to be the obvious pick. I mean, Weird, Weird Al is fantastic, of course. Pick an album? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Just whichever uh, just throw a random one at me yeah it's brilliant it's some of it's dated but the stuff by spike jones who's kind of weird al's predecessor in a lot of ways mm -hmm. some of that still holds up uh, my dad had a cd of a collection of some of the bits from that and some of those are still stuck in my head <laughs> like there's a bit where uh it does this old kind of love song yeah, they play it straight the first time through. My old flame. I can't even remember her name. <laughs> and then they go through it again, but with my old flame. I can't even remember her name. I will have to check my collection of human skulls. <laughs> that kind of humor. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> very nice very nice um i've i've enjoyed some stand-up albums like i mean robin williams live at the met is legendary it's, well i mean yeah of course that's a great one i mean pretty much any um uh george carlin stand-up special genius guy's a brute guy is a guy is brilliant um it's for other stuff i mean the uh Oh shoot! The Homestar Runner album that I am totally blanking on the name of now. Oh yeah, shoot! What, what was that one called? It is uh, Strong Bad Sings and other type hits. Yeah, there, there we, we go. go. There we go. I don't know why I couldn't remember that. <laughs> yes, yes. I like how that was uh, an album in the show first, and then it became the real the name of the real album. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, genius, uh, brilliant album, great stuff. A lot of ninja sex party. Mm -hmm. Some of it for me, it's like, okay, you could try a little harder. <laughs> You're just hitting the same beats. But uh, I mean, some of it, they come, some of it is just brilliant. They come up with the titles first to be fair. So <laughs> in some cases it's like trying to write around the title. <laughs> but some of them like, oh my God, dude. <laughs> everything it's a catchy damn song and then it's also freaking hilarious <laughs> parents house comes to mind good uh, lord i don't know why like there's something about no reason boner that just, <laughs> <laughs> it's so stupid it's such a stupid song but it's so freaking catchy too <laughs> oh man yeah i i do like i do like me some nsp and then, like, Danny Don't You Know is all, is both hilarious and actually really touching. It is, yeah. Danny Don't You Know is wonderful. Yes. And then they they did their own kind of, like, I guess it's a quasi-spinoff band, um, Shadow Academy. I think that was, uh, that's just Dan's other out on their Just uh, Dan? Band. Okay. I think, it's not just him, no, but it's him and another person, right, I believe. just once this isn't comedy but once and evermore is absolutely heartbreaking it's like mm -hmm. you're the same guy who's writing about heart boners <laughs> and I mean, now you're having me here contemplating things like i'm sitting here in a dark alley listening to the rain and on a tin roof come on dude i'm not ready for this i was ready for the ha ha's now you make me do the woo -hoo <laughs> well you know I think a lot of the jokes in uh, NSP tend to come from uh, from Brian's end rather than Dan's. Although I mean, there's a lot of Dan humor in there too, but <laughs> yeah, Shadow Academy is very different, but also very good. And uh, I also enjoy I also enjoy Dan's work with uh, TWRP. 
Good old, yeah, because like good old Tupperware Starlight remix party is perfect. Yeah, it's yeah. like the singular pe- perfect piece of media to ever come out of the human race. It's just <laughs> extraordinary. Yes, yeah, TWRP is excellent. Very good, very good. Not comedy, I guess. Really, well, sort of. No, but but still good. Still, still good. I've been thinking, considering how hypersonic was used once canonically in the entire series, isn't it kind of weird how such a powerful form is used against Eggman once and never again? It's kind of like Goku using Super Saiyan 3 against Raditz. (laughs) Nah, come on. Doomsday Zone. That whole exchange, that's not Raditz tier. (laughs) No. And Doomsday Zone, you don't even need to be hyper to get to. You can just be regular Super. No, but if we're... If we're assuming Sonic 3 and Knuckles all together as one experience, I suppose Sonic gathering all the emeralds, it stands to reason we saw Hyper once. And Sonic Mania has the super emeralds all dried out and cracked. So that assumes that something happened with them. Mm-hmm. But we've I talked guess. about this a lot recently is that it kind of comes down to escalation. You know, what do you do with Hypersonic that makes it more better than Supersonic? And then once that door is open, how do you deal with it? Because once a super is no longer super, then what is it? <laughs> you know, it's kind of like how Super Saiyan is meaningless now in the Dragon Ball franchise. Mm-hmm. It was meaningless by the Boo Saga, let's be honest. But I mean, how fast did they outpace Blue for pity's sake? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know, man. There's so much. When everyone's super, no one is. <laughs> All right, we got one last question. For my final question, considering the amount of fandom discourse, shipping wars, bad faith criticism, and general unpleasantness from certain fans you've dealt with over the years as head writer of various Sonic properties, how do you keep your sense of professionalism? I'm really tempted to give a joke answer, but no, 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 no. I, the one thing to keep in mind is that there's always tomorrow, and the internet never forgets. So as f- frustrating as some of those interactions can be, you have to to step back and say all right what is the long term of this as tempting as it is to just lay into somebody to put out that zinger to say something super dark and snarky what does that serve in the long run Mm -hmm. (laughs) what did she say (laughs) she says it makes me feel good that's right in the moment (laughs) Uh, it's like that spider-man newspaper panel Peter, get off the computer. No, I'm enjoying my anger. <laughs> I like the ones that have edited that one to be <laughs> Zuka-san talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's like to, to stoop to that level is to fall for the bait, is to give them what they want. Yeah. And all that does is diminish my credibility and potentially hurts me as a viable resource because if I'm flying off the handle online, you know, do you really want this guy working on your project? You don't know if he's going to be bad PR. Mm. So it's, you know, it's take the high road. Be a, I try to be as positive as I can be. And if nothing else, ignoring them purposefully makes them angry and I'm spiteful enough to enjoy that. So, so you do enjoy some of it. (laughs) I'm only human, Kyle. I know. I know. Although I don't know if you're going to be a jerk to me, I have no qualms about being a jerk right back. I just do it more passively. (laughs) It depends on who you ask though. If you really are, if you really are. Anyway, some people think doing this show is unprofessional to which I say, yeah, you're right. Good. <laughs> uh, taking questions for money? Gross. <laughs> hey, you can submit for free. We answer free questions. It's just all these people like us and want to support us. So, yeah. <laughs> you can send free questions and they might get answered eventually in a few I years. Hardcore, I, I hardcore do want to get through the standard queue. It's just. We, we're not. We're never going to. <laughs> Never saying that I I will find that file and just read them straight if I have to. Well, I got a pro. I got there's something wrong for there. There's a problem, Ian. There is no file. <laughs> I mean, there's a few different sort of files, but man, there's. I will cobble them 
them together if I have to. You gotta go. You, yeah, it's a lot, Ian. First it's a lot, fun. buddy. It's a lot. I'll tell you. Being on the front I line, it's a mean, lot. <laughs> first and foremost, thousands. First and foremost, there are the folks who have sent us their hard earned money to support us. We owe it to them to answer their questions. Absolutely. And then we'll get to everybody else as fast as we can. Yes. Speaking of folks who have sent us money to answer their questions, thank you, Tetsuya the Wise, for submitting your Bumblecast mini questions. If you want to be as wonderful as Tetsuya the Wise, head over to patreon.com slash bumblecast, ko-fi.com slash bumblecast, or become a YouTube member. All right. I guess that's enough. We'll see you guys in the next one. Stupid money-paying people. <laughs> <laughs>